We'll now call the regular meeting of the Upper County Commission to order. We'll begin with a moment of silent meditation and prayer followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. Amen. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. This time we'll have the reading of the minutes. County Commission of Upstreet County, West Virginia, held their regular meeting at the Courthouse Annex on Thursday, February 16, 2012, at 9 a.m. Donnie R. Tenney called the meeting to order. There were present Donnie Tenney Commissioner, Creed Fletcher Commissioner, J.C. Rafferty Commissioner, William May Parker Administrator, and Jacqueline Dinklocker Secretary. The meeting began with a moment of silent meditation and prayer, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. All motions passed unanimously unless otherwise stated. After reading of the minutes on motion by Creed Pletcher, seconded by J.C. Rafferty, the commission approved the regular meeting minutes of February 9, 2012, as submitted. Jacob Rieger, Upshur County Prosecuting Attorney, and Laura Queen, Victim Services Coordinator, appeared before the commission and provided a review of the Victim of Crimes Act uh, victims Assistance Grant Application for Fiscal Year 2012-2013. After discussion on motion by J.C. Rafferty, seconded by Creed Pletcher, the Commission approved and authorized the President to sign the grant application and all related documents. William Parker advised that agenda item recommendation for removal of Roger Everett as executor for the estate of Mary Louise Strader, deceased, was not ready for con consideration and was removed from the agenda. After discussion on motion by Creed Pletcher, seconded by J.C. Rafferty, the Commission approved and authorized the President to sign the lease agreement between the Upshur County Commission and Craig Smith, dated February 9, 2012 for the Braxton County location of the Lewis Upshur Braxton Community Corrections Program. After discussion on motion by Creed Pletcher, seconded by J.C. Rafferty, the Commission approved and authorized <coughs> the President to sign the contract with the Administrative Office of the West Virginia Supreme Court of Appeals for the employment of Dalton L. Souter for the Upshur County Magistrate Court. The contract amends and replaces the agreement that was discussed and approved at last week's meeting. The Commission re reviewed the following for your information items. Number one, correspondence from the West Virginia Solid Waste Management Board concerning appointment procedures to County Solid Waste Authority Boards. Two, notice of public hearing concerning the Adrian Public Service District Phase 6 Water Extension Project at 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, February 23, 2012. Three, Home Confinement Report, January 2012. Four, Lewis Upshur Animal Control Report, January 2012. Five, Upshur County E911 Communication Center Reports as listed. Six, Agendas and Notice of Meetings as listed. <coughs> meeting, seven meeting minutes <coughs> or financial reports as listed. Eight board of review and equalization schedule listed. Nine meetings, uh, board meetings uh, as listed. Ten appointments needed or upcoming as listed. The Commission approved all invoices for payment. The Commission approved all vacation orders. The Commission approved the following settlements as listed. The Commission approved following consolidation of land tracts as listed. The Commission met with Debbie Thacker Wilfong, Upshur County Clerk, to review matters concerning electronic poll books. No action was taken at this time. The Commission will consider the matter during budget sessions. 
With no further business, on motion by J.C. Rafferty, seconded by Creed Fletcher, the commission meeting adjourned at 11.35 a.m. Are there any additions or corrections to the minutes as read? If not, I'd ask the motion to be approved as such. I'll make that motion. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Those same sign. Motion carries. Okay, it's 9.15, and we have Ronald Fowler, adjutant, disabled American Veterans, Chapter 13. Review financial assistance need for improvements. Good morning, Ron. Good morning, Donnie. Good morning, Good morning gentlemen. Good morning. It's actually okay. Chapter 36. Chapter 36. What yeah. did I say? 13. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I, I saw 36. <laughs> I don't know why I read 13. No, 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 we're lucky, Donnie. We're not unlucky. We're not lucky. Yeah, okay. well, 13 used to be a lucky number. Oh, okay. Maybe that's the reason. Okay, All go right. ahead, Ron. Good enough. Um, I come here this morning with a two-fold two -fold purpose. Uh, the first one is to use this forum as a bully pulpit to appeal to the public for some assistance. Uh, we have a building up there, the home out on the Alexander Road, that is in dire need of some repairs. Over the years, the building has just been patched and put together, but it's finally reached the point that there needs to be some serious consideration given to some a high level of tender loving care. And uh, we put together a plan of work to accomplish that. Uh, there's a number of things that we want to do, but the most urgent need we have right now is that place needs a new roof. I mean, every time I go up there, I expect to see water puddles on the floor. It hasn't happened yet, but <clears throat> we may not make it through another winter without that. Uh, we do not have the money to do that. Uh, we just don't have the ability to raise that kind of money to get that kind of work done. So we have uh, our appealing to the public. We have done it through some letters to the editor. We have done it uh, direct mail, asking for people for assistance to do that. We have uh, had contributions of close to $1,000, but that is only going to cover about an eighth of what is estimated the cost. And if we don't repair that roof and that building, you know, we just might as well get rid of the building. So that's the, basically the public appeal. And if there's anybody willing to make any kind of a contribution to us, no contribution is too small, uh, just send them to the DAV at Box 211 French Creek. And uh, that's 26218. And we will continue to uh, work on that. Now, what we have done in that this is a community effort, a public effort, and, and by the way, I must say that is not only the DAV building where we hold our meetings and keep our stuff. Uh, it is available to the community as a community building to use for birthday parties, family reunions, and that, at very minimal cost. So it is a public service also. Okay. Ron, what was the post office box again? 211. 211, yeah. Um, the, Second thing is, is last year, our total inflows was about $4,400, not much money. And all of that was either, all of that was generated through donations, or we do get a small kickback from, no, I don't call it kickback, but a small rebate from national DAV from the dues amounts to about $500. And all this money is raised through, like I said, donations. Uh, our outflows last year were a little over $3,200. So, you know, we're not operating on a high level budget. And what we've been trying to do was, with that money, of course, most of it goes just keeping the lights on. You got a building, you got expenses. But we do have a mission, and our mission is to provide what services we can to veterans. And we really don't limit to that up in our area because we're such small communities. So a lot of the services we offer are just available to the general public. And some of the things that we have done is we try to keep lift chair, a bed, walkers, assistive equipment available for them to loan, to loan out. And uh, one of our plans is to replace that, but not yet. It, it, it's, it's been pretty well worn. Um, so, What we are asking in that it takes so much of our fundraising money to uh, keep the lights on, just for consideration, if sometime in the future as you folks take a look at the 
available financial resources. If you could give consideration to maybe providing us with some assistance, and particularly like if we, if we could just get the utility bills covered, then that would free up some of our donation money. We bought groceries for people. Uh, we've con we contribute to the uh, VA nursing home down in Clarksburg. We've given some money to the VA hospital so they can buy inpatient, you know, things for them to work with. Those are the things that we try to do and things we can expand on. But as you know, money's the limitation. So that's my twofold purpose. <coughs> I appreciate you guys listening. And any questions you want? Dennis, Dennis, yeah, Dennis. You say something? I have a question. What does it take to join the DEB for extra membership, and how much are the dues? And how are the dues calibrated? Yes, uh, the membership is a lifetime membership. You join by seeing me. We'll fill out an application for you, and I will have to look at the form to see how much the dues are because they're structured by age. The older you are, the less the dues. It's a one-time membership fee. And uh, it's a lifetime membership, and uh, it's basically pretty simple to join like it, yeah. So okay. see me, and we'll fill out the form and make it happen. If, I will try to see you off camera. Oh, okay, okay, sure. Well, I might be here long after you're out of the room. Yeah. We'll take if a not, I'll catch up with you. We'll take okay, a little. Good. We'll take a little break afterwards so you can sign uh, up for your lifetime membership. Then. You know where I live? No. Huh. All right. See me after the meeting. Then. Now, uh, okay, we'll hook up. Ron, uh, I did talk with Region 7 with Rosemary Wagner yesterday, and she's brought her, her big guns her out today. Shane White here. And, the looks and the brains. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, you might have that back, but I don't know. But anyway. Um, <laughs> Batman and Robin? Yeah. Um, I believe it's community partnership grant. Is that the proper it's term? A, it's governor's community participation grant. Participation right. grant. And she said that was the fastest way to get money that's unencumbered money. Sometimes it's the fastest. I know Willie's over there looking because sometimes, uh, you know, our delegates and senators will <coughs> tell you they got you $8,000 and two years later you got the money. So, but uh, also there's, there's some other avenues. She said, Region 7 we'll look into uh, for veterans uh, type programs and things like that. So that's a good beginning right there. Yeah. And, so uh, I need to hook up with these you folks. You need to you need to talk to uh, <coughs> after Shane after we'll take a little break here and they're here for our public uh, hearing in a little bit. But mm -hmm. is there anything else you want to say, no, Shane? I but but uh, you can get with him and and uh, Region 7 is our our grant writing. Uh, mechanism for the county and we want to we want to utilize their expertise and resources yeah so um, we certainly that's the first avenue that we want to uh, pursue on that yeah and uh, we appreciate all the work that the veterans groups do and uh, uh, I know it's a thankless job and a lot of volunteers but I do know one thing I know I've had some mighty good meals at that establishment and some of the best mincemeat pie I believe I've ever eaten. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matter of fact, it was a good, the last time I was there, I bought the whole pie and <laughs> it was very, very good. So one thing I would encourage anybody, if nothing else, when they have their meals, go there and eat because it is good food, yeah. I'll tell you. <laughs> Ron, do you have a special committee trying to raise money or are you the committee? I'm the committee. Well, I might be able to help you. I've got uh, contact that I made with another group I'm trying to trying to help, and uh, I think we may be able to get some money through that group to help you. Oh, we appreciate that. I'll so get I'll with talk, you, and we'll, we'll talk about that. I will say this, that, that you know, it, like I said, we've got $1,000. I, I, I see that as significant, but we've also got some other things. There's a, a group of students over at Westland, uh, Appalachian Experience, Leanne Brown, educate. Uh, they are, they have volunteered and they're going to do the pancake breakfast for us at CJ Maggie's on March the 3rd as a fundraiser. So they anticipate that'll bring in some money. So we've got some other people involved in our goal right now. The immediate need is that roof. And we know the materials, we've priced the materials out. And the best deal we can come up with is $4,200 for materials. Now, once we get beyond that, we all got bad backs. We're all old, we're all overweight. It's hard for us to get up on the roof and work. 
Uh, but we may have some labor costs, but if we get enough money to get those materials, we're going to figure out a way to get them on. Right. So, you know, the immediate goal right out there is to get that $4,200, buy those materials. So. Okay. Okay, guys. Well, thanks Thank a lot, you. Ron, and uh, we'll take a little five-minute recess so you can talk to Dennis and Shane. One of the other things that we have contact, I contacted Paula Moyer with the USDA as community partnership programs. And they have a match matching grant program that she said this project would probably uh, yeah, be eligible for, but it's a competitive, of course, and funding has been limited. But that's another avenue as we look at grants we may throw into the mix. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Yeah, thank you. Oh, we, we do appreciate all you. We, we just, we're just kind of out there and really not much of a public appearance. We appreciate people jumping on and helping us with this. Okay. Well, thanks. Thanks, thanks thank a lot. You. Uh -huh. Let's, thank let's you. take a little recess here, and then our next scheduled appointment is at ten thirty. So, take a break. Take a break. Okay. We are back from uh, our little recess, and I would want to reiterate again uh, Ron Fowler's request for anyone that would like to either help with the uh, disabled American veterans. Um, either by joining or uh, it's DAV post chapter 36 uh, on the Alexander Road and uh, um, and the mailing address is PO Box 211 French Creek West Virginia 26218 so if you'd like to uh, make a contribution or join the, they certainly would welcome that so now our next scheduled appointment is at 10.30, so we have a, almost an hour for that, so we'll go ahead and take care of everything else in the meantime. And then our next scheduled appointment is at 11 o'clock and 1.30 to wrap up our border review. So the first item is correspondence from Region 7 Planning and Development Council re regarding implementation of assessment dues funding plan. And uh, Region 7 has been, uh, since 19, or 2007, the, uh, the board voted to uh, gradually increase the dues so it wouldn't be a burden on the counties and municipalities, member governments, and, uh, and the dues actually will go, um, this year is, uh, will be uh, 50, 50 cent um, per citizen and uh, we'll go uh, to 75 next year and then a dollar the next year and then that's where it will uh, that's where it will stay at and i would um uh, the information from region seven um talks about gives us information on how valuable region seven is to upshur county and uh, <clears throat> the projects that uh, um, upshur county has received is a total of 30 million uh, seventeen thousand five hundred ninety nine dollars so uh, we've certainly that's one of our best investments the dues that we paid our regional uh, councils and it's uh, come back in the uh, come back many fold the part of the the reason for this is that there are uh, there's less grant money that there's administrative fees uh, which region 7 uses to to pay their uh, keep the lights on and pay the help and uh, the other thing is there's there's a lot of these grants that require matching local monies and this this money is used for that which basically leverages that money to you to get more money for the counties and the municipalities and uh, so we're certainly appreciative of all that region seven does for not only upshur county but um, all seven counties region seven has been responsible of bringing in a hundred and over $179,000 of grant money to the seven counties. Uh, maybe. I just was seeing if you were paying attention. <laughs> Sizable difference. Yes. $179 million of grant money. And that's for water and sewer projects and other infrastructure projects. The energy grant that uh, regional councils administered um, that helped courthouses and uh, municipalities upgrade their uh, heating and air conditioning, uh, energy saving uh, 
projects, which save them money then on down the road. So those are good projects. And as we're going to be talking here at 1030 um, with Adrian, Public Service District, um, and our application again for small cities block grant, um, Upshur County, I believe, has probably one of the highest water service rates to the citizens of any county. And it's because of Region 7 working and the PSDs willing to step up to the bat to do what they need to do in order to uh, extend these water lines out into the county. So uh, any, if there's any questions or comments on that, I mean, that's basically it in a nutshell. I don't know if you mentioned the amount of money that they've been able to get us in the form of grants for us. Well, the $30 million, right. $30 million, yeah. So, uh, and they'll continue to work, won't you guys? So we appreciate what you what you do for the good citizens of Upshur County. We have correspondence from Upshur County Solid Waste Authority regarding the reappointment of Joyce L. Harris Thacker. And uh, Joyce has been on the, uh, I think she's been on the Solid Waste Authority since it's been around. I know she, she served on that a long time. And uh, this is a notice from the uh, Burl Smith treasurer of the Upshur County Solid Waste Authority that uh, it's time for reappointment and they're recommending that Joyce be reappointed um, to that position. So do we have a motion that we honor that request? So moved, I'll second it. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same side, motion carries. You can notify Joyce that she's been reseated again. She's active in so many different activities in this county. Right. right. She's very, very dedicated. She is very dedicated. Citizen. She's like the little Energizer Bunny. She just keeps going and going. Yes. Um, financial information, general county fund. Mr. Parker, would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, it's just the monthly information that I provide as it relates to our you know, expenditures for the month and in the month cash balance, uh, which is higher than normal, but we have not done our uh, uh, <coughs> allocation to the uh, HRA healthcare reimbursement account into the OPEB account for the employee benefit funding. So that's one reason it's a little bit higher. Uh, as you'll see, our year to date expenditures are slightly above our year to date uh, revenues. Uh, that's, you know, been uh, the practice of, and on a few years it's usually fairly close at the beginning or anyway but uh, it's not uncommon at this time of year because then we'll, the tax collections will start in February and March for the second half and, and pick up some funding there uh, but at the present time our general county fund is where we're all right budget wise and departmental wise we have a couple of holes to fill in our budget but at this point, we appear to be okay. Okay. Couple holes in the budget, but the ship's still sailing. <laughs> okay. Um, next item is uh, the sheriff's financial statement. Everything on even keel there? Yeah, that's uh, this list, the snapshot at the end of the month. And as you get into budget time, uh, Carol Smith, our bookkeeper, will be providing uh, some information uh, as it relates to some of the funds where payroll reimbursements are, uh, we're having to wait till funding comes in for the pay before we can make payroll reimbursements in some areas. For example, home confinement, I know, is one. We've held an $18,000 uh, payroll reimbursement. They have 23000 in the account now, so we'll be making that, and that'll be running them, you know, down a little bit, but uh, in our dog and kennel fund, you know, usually we're behind to have to hold until money comes in for that. And uh, another area that's becoming a concern is our 911 fund. Uh, as you gentlemen have and know, I've uh, provided information in the past where our landline 911 fees have declined by approximately 30 percent over the past uh, few years. You know, our wireless has went up. It has not went up as much or drastically. There hasn't been an offset, a one-to-one -one offset. So uh, in the future, I may be bringing some numbers or 
a possible recommendation to the commission to take a look at the 911 fee for landlines. Well, people uh, are giving up their hardwire phones. In yes. Lieu of, in favor of the yeah, and wireless. keeping their cell phones, but not necessarily adding a cell phone. Right. <laughs> right. And so that that is becoming an issue when we have a 30 percent decline in the 911 landline fee revenue. Uh, right. And uh, as you gentlemen also are aware, we're you know we have 12. Uh, full-time uh, dispatchers now that have went through the training I think every, all 12 have are, are trained some of them are fairly new at this point but we've not been at that level for a while and they will have some recommendations to fill some other another full-time slot slot and a couple of part-time slots probably next week or if not the following week uh, and, but it's uh, you know been a constant state of training which eats up money when people right. come and go and you're in a constant state of training as well as expenses have went up your revenue is going down and your overall expenses are going up yeah, yeah we we interviewed those people the other night it looked like we had like four good people but i've said this every two months since i've been here <laughs> the turnover turnover ratio is just crazy but unless you would have individual questions on funds and operations, uh, yeah, that's the, some of the concerns I know we'll be taking a look at budget time. Just for educational purposes, well, you might explain how that works as far as reimbursement and how, uh, the funds, these other agencies or these other funds in relationship to the general revenue, exactly yeah. how that works. Through the uh, general uh, county revenue fund, uh, all payroll expenses are supposed to flow through those funds, through the general county fund for uh, the county commission. Uh, so, for example, a home confinement officer, there's a department under the general county fund that we budget for in that area. Then the home confinement fees we use to offset that and reimburse the general county fund, just you know, make a check payable to the sheriff and move the money from one fund, you know, from the home confinement fund in this example, to the general county fund. They're usually 99% of the cases, the reimbursements are going to the uh, general county fund. The assessor's valuation fund is another fund that we uh, do a reimbursement from. Uh, the assessor has people that she has employed either partially or fully through the evaluation fund, and then that money flows back to the general county fund. Uh, yeah, you know, there's, <coughs> you know, E911, uh, the BU, uh, Buckhannon Upshire Airport Authority, uh, home confinement, uh, Curry Library uh, fund. You know, there's numerous funds that fall into that category. Uh, that where the general county fund is the conduit for payroll and the funding, then the base fund is the reimbursement for that. And, and basically, then we go ahead and pay the bills and then submit a bill in total, and then they pay us back for it. Yeah. And, and many of the funds, most of the funds, you know, you know, we do the reimbursements usually on a quarterly basis. The money's there to make the payment. But we've had a couple of funds here recently where the money was not there and we've had to wait right. until that money comes. So we're running a quarter behind or more in some instances. Okay. Okay. Uh, we have agendas and notices of meetings. Uh, minutes of previous meetings, and uh, that looks like that's about it. Like I say, our next scheduled appointment is at 1030 for a public hearing with Adrian Public Service District for their small cities block grant application. So, do you gentlemen have anything else? Willie? Uh, we did receive a letter from the West Virginia County's risk pool. Uh, again, as you gentlemen are aware, I do believe. Uh, James D. La Rosa versus Roscoe LLC and uh, Helen R. Phillips, the assessor, uh, is a civil case and uh, they filed against the office of the assessor as it relates to uh, tax records, in their opinion, not being correct. Our records indicate that they are correct uh, based on the transfer information generated by the office of the county clerk. Uh, but the West Virginia County's risk pool is uh, defending the county, in, in particular Ms. Phillips, under uh, this case with a, you know, a reservation of rights, which 
that means in our public officials area of, the, of our uh, coverage, uh, this is specifically excluded from coverage in almost all, if not all, insurance policies and a writ of mandamus to force a government agency or body or official to do something that they're required to do by law. And, uh, but they're defending that, but will be responsible for the cost at, at the end. Or plus, we have a $10,000 deductible under our public officials liability coverage anyway. So if even if it was covered under our policy, per se, without a reservation of rights, then, we, then we're responsible for the first $10,000. So are coverage. you saying that after the 10000 we have coverage or we don't? We do not at this point. They're defending us with a reservation of rights, which means they have the right to recover the cost. Uh, the risk pool has I mean, reserving the right to cover the cost based on the determination of the outcome of the case. Because there's no monetary damage awards being asked for now, if the case changes and there's monetary you know, damages awarded, you know, which I don't foresee they would be in this case, then that would change uh, the situation. But uh, this is how it was under our previous policy in the private industry. And same same uh, policy. Is, you know, government official, you know, you cannot, if it's proved that you cannot get, uh, you know, coverage for an actor supposed to have been to be formed, you know, either statutorily, regulation, or constitutionally. Uh, but they're reserving their right to recover their cost. The risk of it. Yes. So now in that case, since that has to do with valuations, could that cost be paid out of the assessor's valuation fund? Well, it doesn't have to do with valuations per se. What the case is, is a deed comes into the office of the county clerk. This is coal properties in particular is what is at issue here. But uh, the party A comes in, sells to party B certain properties, coal, whatever the case may be. The office of the county clerk generates transfer listings, transfer data, based on what the deed has as well as the sales listing form that the attorney has prepared. And uh, then those tr transfer listings are, tran are transmitted or sent to the office of the assessor. The assessor takes those transfer listings and transfers that map and parcel number, the property, whatever the case may be, to the new property owner, to party B. And uh, uh, prosecuting attorney uh, Jake Rigger and I have looked at that during one of our board of review hearings. And the transfer listings were all generated by the office of the county clerk. The assessor appears to, at this point transferred correctly based on that data. Uh, so it's just a matter of getting, my opinion, the assessor dismissed from the suit. But you end up spending a few thousand dollars in getting that accomplished uh, is what the county is looking at. Uh, now, how, long if, ago, how long ago did that happen? Mm, the original, I think from, was 1991 is when the deed issue may have started. It appears like the office of the county clerk transferred the correct information also on based on the deed based on the deed <clears throat> reading by Mr. Rigger and myself, you know, he's much more familiar with it of course than I am. But it appears <clears throat> that the office of the county clerk transferred the correct uh, property also based on that. So it's, you know, a matter of maybe some interpretation of the deed and sales listing form, you know, and you know, theoretically if if we have cost involved in were proved to be correct based in the deed, and you know we could probably go back to the original attorney or the uh, people that are bringing the case. Now, whether we would be able to recover or not, I, you know, I don't know if it's not you know clear per se. But it's uh, it's an issue where we're going to spend a few thousand dollars to get somebody dismissed and a public official dismissed from a lawsuit, well, and that is not uncommon in the risk pool to spend four or five thousand dollars to get someone dismissed from a case, uh, whether it be a reservation of rights or whatever the case may be, or a county or public official. Uh, so did it, did this, has this issue not come up since 1991? Not uh, been discussed or? It hasn't been questioned until now. Until now. And it wasn't <laughs> questioned in any way, any time until the lawsuit was filed? Not 
Well, there was, yes. There were there several was, transfers of that property. You know, yeah, there before. was transfers of the property. You know, it didn't go directly from, uh, you know, from one to the other. There, uh, there was another party involved that, that transferred it to uh, uh, Roscoe LLC. But there was, uh, as far as I know, representatives uh, from James D. La Rosa, whatever the firm is, or maybe Mr. La Rosa himself, I don't know, or his attorney, did a visit to the assessor's office requesting that the property be transferred. Well, you know, I can't walk in and request that Mr. Rafferty's property be transferred. I can, but the <laughs> office shouldn't transfer Mr. Rafferty's property to my name based on that request, and of course they did not. And, uh, and uh, they've tried to work out evidently issues between the two parties. One party says it's ours, another one says no, it was sold correctly in the deed and transferred correctly, it's ours. So thus the lawsuit between the two parties with the office of the assessor brought in because they refused to, they transfer. Refused to transfer. And probably, in my opinion, rightfully so. Correct. <laughs> but that's what litigation is all about. That is why people <laughs> wear black robes. <laughs> Part of the cost of doing business. But it will be a few thousand dollars probably just to get dismissed. Whatever happened to the concept of King can do no wrong? <laughs> okay. Anything else? If not, we'll while we're waiting for our next appointment, we'll start on our paying the bills. Okay, we're back from our recess and it's ten thirty. <coughs> Time for a public hearing with Adrian Public Service District concerning small cities block grant application. So who wants to speak first? Uh, Shane, are you the sorry. spokesperson? Please pay attention. My bad. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, good yep. morning. Good morning, good morning. Shane from uh, Region 7. My name is Shane Whitehair. I'm with Region 7 Plain Development Council, and Carrie Smith is with me today. Hi, Carrie. Um, well, unfortunately, I was afraid. Oh, well, actually, I'm it's kind of dissatisfying that we're here again this year. We've this I think this is our fourth year, Nina, in doing this. And um, if you can remember, in the for the last four years, we had to do a, a public hearings to submit the small cities block grant application for the Adrian Phase Six water extension. Um, two years ago, we received a two hundred thousand dollar design grant, and which basically has been spent. But last year we were hoping to get the remaining funds that we asked for, but we were unfortunate in that request. So that's why we're again here again uh, this year doing the same thing. So with that, um, if nobody has forgotten to sign in, please do so before you leave. We got to have a record of who's in attendance. You want to bring um, it up here? We'll... Is everyone back here, there I'll signed it? it? <clears throat> you signed it. Okay, thanks. Um, before I get into project specifics, let me give you a few things in regards to uh, this year's program for the Small Cities Block Grant. Um, they're expecting to receive approximately $13 million. Um, so if you take out the state administrative costs and the technical assistance costs and all the other costs, um, you're looking about two and a half to three million dollars that they're going to have to play with for the entire state of West Virginia. Um, very competitive when you only got two and a half million dollars versus, you know, and they usually get 50 to 80 million dollars in requests a year. It's pretty competitive. Mm -hmm. yep. um, what they'll do is they'll, they have the intent to commit up to approximately five million dollars of 2013's allocation, which will allow them to fund more projects. So basically, they're borrowing from next year's allocation to fund more projects that are submitted this year. If that makes any sense. And then the next year they'll borrow. They'll from do the, the same next thing. Year. And that's the 13 million dollar allocation that they received. 10 million is taken out from this year's allocation from last year's. From last budget. year. Okay. So it's a continuing thing. Uh, the deadline to submit an application is March 26th, I believe, yes. Um, basically, the app's already done. Just a few updates here and there. Um, no major changes other than we did receive, or the PSD received last month, a million dollar grant from the United States Department of Agriculture, um, Rural Utility Service Grant, which is absolutely huge for us. Um, 
it allows them to borrow less um, and also is committed other funds to the project which enhances its ability to receive other funding so that was a huge step um, since the last hearing before I open up for comments I will go over a few things which I have a handout that nine has prepared so if you want to take one pass around um, there's a couple things I want to point out you know they they look at projects due to the allocation um, the expenditure rates they look at uh, projects that are ready to proceed and they want to fund projects that are not going to sit there a while so I think this one fits their their criteria in that you know it's not going to be sitting you know, this project's ready to go basically since last year's hearing uh, since we did this last year the design has been completed plans and specs are finished um, the health department uh, approved the plans and specs and they've issued their permit <coughs> DOH has approved and reviewed the plans. Um, they'll issue their permit once we get closer to the construction part of it for the bonding and everything. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, USDA committed a million dollar grant to the project. Um, we have spent the, as I mentioned earlier, you know, this project received a $200,000 design grant. Um, basically all that, almost all of it has been spent to uh, pay for the design of the project and then also the PSD um, obtained a design loan from the Infrastructure Council to assist with the upfront cost to get to the point start construction. What's the schedule look like? The schedule looks like if we're fortunate enough, it all depends on the funding commitments. I mean, Public Service Commission has to issue a certificate before you're allowed to start construction. Okay, well, you're not allowed to apply for that certificate until all the funding is committed. So we're kind of working backwards, okay? So um, basically, if the funding's committed this fall of 2012, uh, the schedule and the hope is to start construction the following summer. Um, I believe that's accurate. And basically, the district is currently right now trying to get users signed up and getting the right of ways and so forth. So, once the funding is committed, um, we can submit to the Public Service Commission and then we'll be ready to go. Um, am I leaving anything out? Yeah. Sound pretty good. So, with that, um, I'll leave the floor open to any questions, uh, comments anybody may have. Now the uh, the million dollar grant that was not anticipated. Correct. Right. So that was just manna from heaven. Well, I think the there was I think the district and the engineer had had discussions with USDA previously, and then they came through with it, I believe. So did that? Where 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 did that? Where was that million dollars going to come from? They were going to borrow that. And borrow some yes. more. Borrow instead of three the, million, borrow four million. Exactly. Well, that's certainly, I'm sure the existing customers will be happy about that one. Okay. <clears throat> and the, I, f I forgot to mention the, we will be requesting with this application $1.3 million. Um, and with the $200,000 grant, that takes the maximum amount you're allowed to ask for, which is 1.5. On the small cities. On the small cities, yes. <clears throat> it's still a $5.5 million project. Um, so... The only thing that's changed is the amount of money that they will borrow versus the amount of grant that they got. So, what are you what are you finding <clears throat> within the last two years as far as how bids are coming in on projects with the economy like it is? Actually, pretty good. That's helping. Mm -hmm. Where where I believe this this project uh, the cost went up because of the amount of time involved in it. Uh, so far, it has not. It hasn't. No, I think the, Maybe they kind of. That was the other project, was it? That was yeah. your, your, your project you finished. I know usually the longer it drags on, the more the cost. That's the only good thing, I guess, about the economy like it is that <coughs> contractors are hungry and so they're bidding leaner to, just to get projects to, to keep the doors open and equipment running. So, okay, well, that uh, I'm sure those 164 new customers. Uh, we'll be very happy if we can get this all put together. So, uh, and the the district has taken steps to move us along. I mean, they they went out on a limb and and you know obtained a design loan about the same time that the design grant was approved two years ago, which is kind of 
coincidental, yeah. So anyway, uh, they've taken steps to move the project along and um, hopefully this year we'll cross the, the finish line to get all the funding and then start, the start the thing, so. Okay. What would the time frame be that if you were to be successful to hear something like this? Um, the announcements are usually made, I tell you, it varies year to year. Um, I've seen announcements made as early as October and as late as February. So say, for example, they make an announcement in October, which is the hope. Um, they'll submit to the Public Service Commission probably within a month or two later and have, you know, be able to advertise and start construction the following summer. So summer 2013 is the hope to start actually construction. Yeah. More than a year. Yes. So a year, year to a year and a half from today. Okay. So what's our timeline? Have we met the, the uh, obligations as far as where we're ready to uh, approve the grant application for yeah. small cities block grant on behalf of Adrian? We're ready to do that after this hearing? Yes. Okay. Absolutely. Well, the, we'll um, any resubmittal, uh, if you do not get funded the previous year, the next year you apply, you're only required to, to uh, do one hearing, public hearing, did it too. what they refer to as a resubmittal hearing. Right. And that's what this is today. So. Yeah. Well. Anybody have any other comments, questions? Anything, you know, anything to help us out to um, include in the application, just let us know. We'll make sure it's, it's put in there. But like I say, everything's basically um, pretty good shape. Carrie's been working on it, so. Do you have anything? Okay. Then we will uh, declare the public meeting closed. And then I would ask for a motion that we approve the small cities block grant application uh, for Adrian Public Service District in the amount of 1.5 million? 1.3. 1.3 because you got the two last year. Right. I'll second. Okay. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed same sign. Motion carries. It's been a very successful meeting. And here. Well this is what happens when everybody works together. Good things happen for the people that we're all here serving. So. Well, there is one thing I told you. Um, Trey Horner, the engineer, was going to be here, but he had a prior obligation. So, well, I think so. And he, he did send us an email, which the information on the handout was in, in his email. So I wanted to make sure I let everybody know that. Okay. Well, he explained everything last year. Yeah. So I was out of the uh, room here a little bit. But did you mention it was serving Webster County also? So Correct. it's a multi county project. Correct. Okay. Yes. And actually, the fact that it's going into Webster County actually lowered the cost per customer yes. for the Webster County exactly. residents. Made it more feasible. Made it more feasible to do the project. So, so everyone should be happy. <coughs> and since I'm I'm in Webster County now, Thomasville is in Webster County. Oh, that's right. <laughs> at least in the House of Delegates' minds, it at least is in the House it? of Delegates. <laughs> mind. So uh, I guess that that puts us in a good situation yeah, it's the first thing we can do together as Upshur County and and uh, Webster County citizens of Upshur County okay well we thank you all for coming in and keep up the good work and <clears throat> if you want to talk to Terry Joe she's in her office I believe now. Thank, thank you for your efforts for your support okay today. thank you for your efforts and attentiveness to that program okay keep up the good work and your willingness to serve, that's important. Okay. I don't know if everybody can sign in. I don't know if Dennis did or. <coughs> Are you going to do anything more for the next 20 minutes? No. What are we going to here? Yeah. I actually bought two. But I want to introduce yourself because you you're on camera. Because okay. you have a camera on. Yeah, I would want to. Uh, because it says no that you're, what you're giving us today. Not a problem. My name is Will Wesley, and I'm with um, Election Systems and Software. And I'm here to do a presentation of our electronic poll book. Um, I have a uh, fully functional demonstration that I'll be able to show you everything that it, that it can do everything that West Virginia requires. 
That's good. Good job. And I, I really didn't want to set it up prior to this because I wanted everybody to see um, how to set it up because this is what your poll workers would have to go through in the morning. And it's very simple. You'll see it's got a really um, nice case that uh, keeps the poll book and the attachments to it would actually be in a separate bag. Um, we do have, this is my personal bag, but we do have a bag that you can uh, purchase to carry these two items. Now, one of the items is actually optional. You're not really required to have this in West Virginia, and that is this printer. This printer right here that goes with it is a printer that will print out um, an address of someone. If you have to look someone up and they're in the wrong precinct, you can actually print out an address and hand it to them and say, you know, here's where you need to be voting. Um, it'll also print out a, I forget what you call it. When they, it's, it's, an, it's, a, form, it's a document that you give them uh, when they sign in at the table that says I've, I've signed in. Is it an application to vote? Is that what it is? A post slip? A post slip. Post slip, okay. And what I've done with this post slip, because it's a demo, it's going to print out a pretty long strip. And the reason I did that is because I told our programmers every option that you could possibly print out on this post slip, I want you to print it out on this demo. You can have this thing not be on at all, or you can print as much as this stuff, and I think there's like 40 items from your database that you can print out. But that would be your call. Prior to the election, we would let you fill out a form. You tell us what you wanted to do, and then we make it do that. The other uh, thing that it will print out is a provisional ballot form. Uh, you know when a person shows up and they qualify to do a provisional ballot, you can actually tell the poll book, I want them to do a provisional ballot, and I'll show you that. And it will then, at the conclusion of that, print out the same kind of form. There's about 40 items that you could put on that. And there's also signature lines at the bottom of the provisional ballot form. I've seen a, few, a couple counties that are really excited about this, like Kanawha. Um, they were excited about that because she said, Vera said it eliminates some of the forms that you have to fill out for provisional ballots. And her intent is to just print this out, have the voter sign it, staple it to the envelope um, when you, you put the provisional ballot in it, and then that serves as what you would use during your canvas to determine if that voter qualifies or not. Do they use that in Lincoln County? Yes, they do. Well, ac actually, this is the first time. They've actually used our other poll book, but um, everybody in the state will be using this going forward. And um, I did just talk to Lincoln County. Um, they're going to be, right now, they're just using it for early voting. But they're expanding to, I believe, six regional sites around Lincoln County. And they're going to use this poll book in all of those. <laughs> and at the last meeting I had, she said that they wanted to use it countywide now. They're looking at putting it in every precinct. Um, so we'll talk about pricing in a minute, too. Um, I don't have the exact pricing, but I know under the previous version of Poe Book, it was about, for everything that you see, it was about $3,000 for a set. That included the printer? That, that includes the printer and the signature pad that I'm going to pull out here in a second. But with this Poe Book, that's actually about half price. So, so if you wanted to do it, like, say, in one early vote site, it would cost you about 3000 the reason I say that is because we, all, we always recommend you have at least two mm -hmm. because you don't want to run a dual uh, system where you got to print the paper ballot, paper poll book, and have the electronic poll book. You, you always want to have a backup. That's Question? Right. right. The only thing I think I do want to correct, I think you were talking about Kanawha County, right? Mm -hmm. When you mentioned Lincoln, you said it went to Lincoln, it's Kanawha County. But actually both counties are using it. Lincoln County is using it also. Lincoln is our, has used it for, I want to say maybe a year and a half now. We've got four counties in the state that are currently using our poll book. Jackson County, uh, Monongalia, Lincoln, and Wyoming. And so they're going to continue to use it. Uh, Canal just indicated that, uh, that they're interested, and we're going to do a pilot with them this coming May election in uh, four precincts, two polling locations. And then the intent is to go countywide with it in all 187 precincts if everything works out okay. Mm -hmm. How would you determine who's going to uh, use them, Debbie? Or your poll clerks would. But I'm just the right poll now, clerks? Yeah, just the poll clerks. What I'm running right now is just for early voting. Right. You want to try right. out an early voting, and then maybe go to the larger precincts. And use it. Yeah. So we need two two units. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have it in one site. 
These two units right here are actually designed, you don't have to do any additional programming, to work together. So say if you had a sign-in table over here, and you had a sign-in table over here, and someone came in and signed it over here. There's a cord that basically runs between the two poll books that as soon as they sign it over here, it synchronizes with the other one. Right. So there's no chance that they could slip around the room and uh, yeah, right. try to vote again. <clears throat> now, if you need a wide area network, meaning that if, like in the case of Lincoln, where they're going to have six regional sites set up, um, through internet connectivity, you get the same result. And then you would tell it or program it to synchronize uh, as often as you think it should. Uh, we typically recommend nothing more than 10 or 15 minutes uh, for that synchronization to occur between all the sites because we don't think that um, in most cases, unless you tell us otherwise, someone could vote here and be at the other site within 10 to 15 minutes you know, while it's uh, not synchronized. Hopefully so. that's not happening in any county in West Virginia. Even though they're trying to get a higher voter turnout, that's not mm -hmm. the way to do it. That's not the way to do it. <laughs> yeah. 